Good morning. Good morning. Today is 19 August, the year 2014. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum along with a uh, special guest, Cynthia uh, Prieto and uh, Jean Prieto. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of Sergeant Raul Prieto. Uh, Sergeant Prieto actually was the uncle of Jean, so Jean is going to tell us uh, his story. Uh, the sergeant, uh, I believe it was on his first mission as a B-17 top turret gunner and flight engineer. And uh, as I understand, uh, there was a, a mid-air collision uh, over Belgium? Uh, over um, the um, eastern part of Germany near the Czech border. Okay. Approaching uh, the target at Leipzig. They were actually northbound because they uh, they bombed downwind so they could drop their bombs and then bank off and and have a kind of a wind behind them. <laughs> so we're going to talk to Gene about that and a lot of other things about his uh, his uncle who um, uh, is very special in Gene's heart. I know. Gene, really good to have you here, buddy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, Gene, would you uh, repeat and spell uh, Raul's uh, uh, name, please, for us? His name is Raul R. Prieto. And uh, how do you spell that? That's R O A U L. Okay. And I've asked uh, certain people. Uh, why it just wasn't R-A-U-L and uh, e I tend to get the feeling that it's it's very European Raul. Well how is it normally spelled? R-A-U-L. Oh, okay. In fact uh, on the picture that I've given the museum today it has a, a, a signature by him to Mama and Papa uh, from uh, Raul, R-A-U-L. Oh. And uh, when and where was he born? Uh, he was born uh, April 3rd, 1924 in Los Alamitos, California, Orange County. Uh, the family had moved there uh, from uh, Jimenez, uh, Chihuahua, the state of Chihuahua in Mexico. Uh, during the teens, uh, the early part of the 20th century, and uh, they, uh, some of the men went to work for a sugar beet factory that was there, and uh, so they congregated uh, around that um, that little town there. So was, was that about the time of Pancho Villa and all that stuff going on in Mexico? Exactly, exactly. That's why they wanted uh, my great grandmother Marina wanted her, especially the girls, uh, to come to the north uh, because of the uh, loose social values of soldiers. In a fight, in a you know, in a war, and they were afraid, you know, for the girls, and also the men who came uh, did not want to serve in, in the Federal Army of Mexico. They were, you know, they they figured that it wasn't worth giving one's life for that, and so they came across the border. Uh, there was a total of. Uh, maybe nine, uh, two stayed in Jimenez, uh, and also my great-grandmother Marina, and, uh, but she came to visit in the late 20s. She came to visit the family in Los Alamitos and, and stopped by to see her two sons, uh, uh, 
Antonio and Francisco Prieto, who had moved to Palm Springs. This was in uh, 28, 1928. Rawl was four years old, and uh, we have a picture of a little boy uh, who is being held by my grandmother. You see that I, and uh, my dad is kneeling next to his grandmother, my great grandmother, Marina and she passed away shortly thereafter in the mid-30s. And uh, an uncle, a great uncle of mine, uh, Everardo Estavillo, uh, stated he menaced, and uh, uh, so did, uh, I'm trying to remember, Carolina uh, Estavillo. And, uh, her son fathered a baby boy, and uh, he lives in uh, in Torreon. His name is uh, Mario Lozoya Sotomayor, and uh, he's uh, well to do, and uh, he's he's a, a gregarious personality. Uh, Where did you say he lives? He lives in Torreón, Coahuila. Where is that? Mexico. Oh. It's the state just to the south of Chihuahua. I see. And, and where is Chihuahua in relation, say, to Mexico City or the coast? Or, or well, it borders. Uh, it borders the United States, uh, Texas, New Mexico. Uh, oh, okay. See, but. Uh, he menaces about 500 miles, I believe, below the border from uh, El Paso, Texas. Yeah. Um, and Raul's parents, what were their names? My my father, my grandfather, uh, Antonio uh, Luján Prieto, and uh, my grandmother, Zisidra uh, Pérez uh, Prieto. Perez, Perez was her maiden name? Yes. I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, now, and the family, you said, I don't know, <clears throat> or some of them at least came to Palm Springs. Do you know why they came here? <laughs> well, there was jobs here. It was a growing community. A lot of people were building homes and golf courses were starting to, you know, catch on. And, uh, I think the first one was um, the O'Donnell golf Madonna, course yes. uh, uh -huh. up against the mountain. Right. And some of the families came and uh, they allowed them to pitch their tents there, you know, and, and go out and start working, you know, support services, construction. Uh, my relatives may have even uh, uh, helped to pave Palm Canyon. And from a, uh, I think my brother used to tell me it was a company from Long Beach, who came down and uh, and paved that that street. How old was Raul when he moved here? Raul was uh, less than than a year, by about uh, two weeks, something like that. And where did they live? Maybe. They came and pitched a tent. Uh, off South Palm Canyon, uh, up against the mountain, there used to be a trailer park there. I don't remember the name of the trailer park, but Bellardo Road goes right by there. In fact, uh, Mr. Westman is doing a uh, some kind of development there, and they pitched the tent there and stayed for a while until his brother and, and uh, Francisco and Antonio, my grandfather, but build a home in what is today's section 14 and uh, that was located in an old dirt street called uh, Santa Rosa I believe Santa Rosa doesn't exist anymore it would be uh, between Calle and Celia uh, South Calle and Celia and El Segundo the first home they, they moved to and then later on they built a home over towards Our Lady of Guadalupe, just southeast of there, uh, approximately 200 yards.
from the church itself. And uh, there's where Rawl actually grew up, really. And uh, it was during the Depression while he was growing up. And uh, my grandfather used to pull him out of school to help, you know, with the work. And, and then young Edmund, uh, uh, we used to call Weddle, uh, the youngest the boy. Uh, and then there was my Aunt Stella, the youngest. Yeah, he also started to help. And, as I remember him, he he was very hardworking and uh, paid attention to his job. You know, he did a good job as he was growing up, and he went in the navy after the war. Came out. Uh, did uh, Raul's family? Did they live pretty close to your family? Yes. Um, in fact, um, my so mom and dad. My mom and dad lived uh, with my grandfather and grandmother on the old Pomeroy Ranch. Where was that? That's located just west of uh, the old uh, racket club. It's, uh, you might say it was the corner of uh, North Indian Avenue, and now it's called what, Indian Canyon Way, and, uh, and racket club. It would be the northwest corner. Uh, so they lived there for a while, and then uh, Mrs. Pomeroy uh, sold the land. I believe her first name was Edna Pomeroy, Pomeroy. and she moved back to, uh, to the L.A. beach area. And my grandfather, of course, uh, moved closer to uh, Don Francisco, his brother, and. Uh, and the other Mexican family, so it was a Mexican colony, a barrio, you know. Uh, none of the streets were paved, and once in a while, uh, John Wilmus, a member of the tribe, would come by with a tractor, level it off, and within a week it was a back to a washboard road. <laughs> so, Raul, was he your father's brother? Yes. Okay. And again, what's your father's name? Antonio. Antonio. Tony. Tony. Uh, Perez Prieto yeah. Jr. So were they pretty close? Yes. Uh, uh, my father had a lot of faith in Raw. He, uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why uh, they made a trip while I was uh, being made. I wasn't born yet. In 1938, in July. And uh, they went to El Paso, Texas to see a great aunt. And so uh, uh, he was either 12 or 13. But she, my, my dad, uh, felt that if something happened to him, you know, that Rawl could drive and fix a tire. Because he was really mechanically inclined. Uh, a few years later, him and Nick Mustachio one of his close buddies that he grew up with uh, built a, a car uh, of parts, different parts, and uh, they used to ride around Section 14. This is what I was told. And all the kids would get excited and they'd jump on it. It was just a frame and motor and transmission, you know. And uh, Nick Mustachio told me this story that before he passed away. Uh, that they were on Ramon Road going east, and <laughs> and here comes the local police officer. I think there was only one in a car with a red light. So they just pulled off into the desert like a dune buggy, and went and parked it and covered it with a canvas, <laughs> but and they didn't get caught. But, but you know, as a young boy, he started working at garages, helping the mechanics and learning, you know. I know that he spent some time in the garage of Lou Billington, who was one of the first, uh, I guess, pioneers. Uh, and also at the Plaza Motors, he spent time there. And then gardening with my grandfather, but he was a uh, 
very knowledgeable, intelligent young man. Uh, all the other uh, young children and even the grown-ups used to kind of look up to him. You know, they could tell that he he was a little bit above <laughs> the rest. Now, did he have brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, I yes. Yeah, of course, my, my dad, Tony, and right. then after uh, him was uh, Edmund. Prieto, uh, we called him Huero, and then Stella Prieto, who later became uh, Stella Prieto Salazar from another Mexican family. And uh, it's not the Rudy Salazars, is it? No, it's uh, no, no, okay. it's not. And I used to play ball with Rudy. Yeah, Rudy was a. <laughs> Rudy was a kick. <laughs> you know, he was a nice man. Yeah. You know, but uh, his uh, mother uh, was first married to another gentleman who uh, died in an automobile accident. Uh, his real name, I don't know. All I know is his nickname. And uh, it's the Victorina. Victorina Garcia. Uh, later she married Rudy Salazar. But Victorina is my godmother. Oh. And she just passed on here four or five years ago. Uh, that was a family from Texas. They were from Texas. And uh, when you're, uh, when they, uh, when they came to Palm Springs, did they speak English very much, or do you, do you know? I mean, you weren't around, but Just I mean, you Just passingly, yeah. uh, enough to get by, probably. Uh, my grandfather, Antonio, uh, didn't do much to pick up the lingo. Uh, neither did my other grandfather. They were uh, uh, Mexican citizens, and they told you so. And uh, my other grandfather, my my mother's stepdad, uh, he finally uh, passed the exam, raised his hand, and mm -hmm. became a naturalized citizen. So did my grandmother. But my other grandparents, they were uh, Mexicanos. They, they loved Mexico. And uh, I still have, I believe, his green card his permission to live here. My grandmother's, I don't know who has it, but uh, you know, they, he was an intelligent man. Uh, he had gone to formal school uh, beyond what they call in Mexico la prepa, the preparation to go to, on to a university, and he did. They sent him to a university and he did quite well and uh, I remember as a child, uh, I would sit close to my grandfather and as he was catching a nap, he had just woken up or whatever. And he would tell me stories uh, of Shakespeare and, and uh, Chaucer. And he knew those authors, you know. And he was quite a guy, you know. He, his uh, livelihood was making uh, what would you call it? Uh, a horse and buggy, uh, cushions and uh, saddles and reins and you know all the paraphernalia, the leather stuff that goes in in taking care of horses and stuff. But of course, those were the days when the horses were going out of style. You see, but. Uh, also, back in those days, uh, late teens and twenties, was it difficult for Mexican people to come to the United States and live here? If you proved uh, your birth place and then and then you were married, they wouldn't let single people across. And then you had to pay a ten dollar capitation tax. My father always used to say. So to cross the border, he says, my parents had to pay for me ten dollars. <laughs> but but you know, my dad uh, had a great memory, 
my father was born with a great memory. He remembers the little boy coming by train from Chihuahua to El Paso and seeing men hung from telegraph poles. And uh, he said it, it was for real, the, the revolution, yeah. a lot of starving going on armies would come by and take all the food and all the young gals and it was very difficult and uh, it was at the times of Villa. Villa controlled that area, see, and uh, he had spent some time in Jimenez and, and uh, Daniel Perez uh, saw him up close. Uh, that's my grandmother, with a Isidra, Rawls' mother, uh, nephew that she brought up. He was a little older than my dad, and he stayed in Mexico a little longer. And uh, he experienced all these things that... Uh, you might like to see a movie if you haven't already seen it. I just got it. In fact, as I'll be bringing it into the museum, it's called Babanos con uh, Pancho Villa. Mm -hmm. It's a Mexican, uh, it, it's in Spanish, yeah. and of course it's about Pancho. It was made in 1936. Mm. Uh, um, I think I, Domingo Solar or something that's in it. Anyway, um, um, I'll have it here sometime. If, if you haven't already seen it, you might enjoy watching it. Yeah. The uh, 36, uh, it was still wild. Yeah. It was still wild. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think was it the late twenties again? They, they, um, kind of were persecuting the Catholic Church down there and yeah. killing the priests and nuns and stuff like that. Uh, there was a movie about that a few years ago. The uh, Cristero. Exactly. Yeah. I believe that was uh, under the uh, presidency of Felix. A guy named Felix, or Fierro, Felix or Fierro, and he followed up uh, after Obregón was assassinated, and uh, he was totally against the church. Yeah, he was atheist yeah. probably or something. In fact, uh, uh, her mother and, and her dad uh, married civilly in Mexico. And then later on, married by the church. They weren't allowed to be married they by the church. They weren't allowed. No, yeah. it was a real hard. It got real hard down there. But uh, the big guy in Chihuahua that uh, Zia threw out was uh, what was that guy's name? That whose son ended up being the mayor of Pico Rivera. See, I forget names, but. Uh, <laughs> The, that family was big and powerful and uh, took land, just moved people out and took their land. They were into mines and of course cattle. And this guy married uh, his daughters to foreigners, English, you know, Spanish. And in, in fact, uh, this Englishman who married one of them, uh, I forget his name, it'll come to me anyways, uh, this Englishman married into that family and uh, he had uh, great power, you know, here there's a foreigner in this guy's. Well, it comes out that uh, one of the guys, one of those Englishmen was named Benton and uh, Pancho Villa had an assassin, a real assassin. His name was Rodolfo Fierro. Good looking man. You know. But he'd kill you if he didn't like you or he, he thought you might, you know, say something wrong to him, he'd pull out his gun and do you in right there. Well, this Benton did something to him. And uh, Fierro went and uh, killed him. In fact, uh, Winston Churchill never forgot that. And he, he wanted to start a big investigation because this Benton 
came from powerful people in England, but uh, they uh, they'd finally smoothed over, you know. But uh, Winston Churchill <laughs> really got angry. They say, you know. So Raul, um, where did he go to grade school? Well, Raul, you know, as a child, began at Francis Stevens, and like everybody else, and went to Nellie Kaufman, and then to the high school. Tell me about his high school years. Well, they, according to uh, some of the uh, people I've talked to, uh, he was a good athlete, could run fast. He used to play tennis, and he ran track, and he played a little football, but he was really small. And he played with a uh, man who's quite elderly now, Bob Leno, uh, who owned some business in Cathedral City. But Bob, Bob Leno's brother, Herbert Leno, also died in a B-17 over France. See, But uh, he played, uh, there's a picture of him uh, standing uh, with a B-team basketball team, and he's standing next to Joe Sanifer. Uh, that's another family that was close to the Prietos. And uh, Joe Sanifer, when he came home from the South Pacific, he had been involved in that battle off Lingayen Gulf, uh, where we were landing troops on, uh, on an island there uh, and uh, there was uh, support aircraft carriers, LSTs and, and destroyers 80, 100 miles off the coast to protect the, the landing uh, ships which were really vulnerable. And lo and behold, Halsey get, takes his fleet out of the area, and here comes the, the German uh, fleet. Jap Japanese. Yeah, the Japanese, and they went to battle with these guys, and here we lost two destroyers and a couple of escort carriers and stuff. But in that uh, fight, the Gambier Bay got caught and lost most of its sailors. Well, in the anti-aircraft marine unit aboard, that was Alan Hall. Really? Okay. So him and a good friend of his, Joe Sanifer, they were manning the five inch on the front of the LST. He said he saw that, that it was a, like a kamikaze type attack, and he saw that. When he came home, he told the various people that he had seen that ship where Alan Hall was killed. Uh, just one of the little stories, you know. Yeah, that group was Taffy 3, <coughs> I think, and they were just like, say, small destroyers, and That's right. they you know, went up against these Jap battleships and cruisers coming down, yeah. and uh, of course they didn't really have a chance, but for some reason the Japs turned around and, and went and back. Went back and, and, you know. Because they, they thought they were up against a lot more than they were, I guess. Yeah. Oh, those two destroyers uh, just bit into him, wouldn't let go, and uh, yeah. Yeah. the Japanese thought they were cruisers. They were just little destroyers. Yeah, but like you're talking about, it saved the whole invasion. You can imagine how many guys would have got killed if uh, they uh, opened up on them. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. No, that was, that was really sad. Huh. Yeah. When in high school then, uh, wh who were some of his best friends? Oh, he had one called Charles Riley, tall kid, and, and they always hung together, see, and uh, Nick Mustachio and his younger brother, uh, Pat. And uh, Pat used to run the uh, cameras for the Village and Plaza Theater. So Rob was always getting in there, you know, and he'd see the latest movies. And there was another man who had been in the service, went in the service too, and he used to help Pat run those projectors. 
And he just passed away. But I'm trying to remember his name. Okay. <laughs> Did he have any girlfriends in high school? Do you know? It probably uh, there was uh, Jeanette uh, Martineau Curtis, uh, who's quite elderly and ill now. She came to the uh, American Legion. Uh, Martineau. Did you know a Pierre Martineau? I said, uh, he had a uh, uh, sports sporting goods store uh, back in. I used to play uh, softball with him. Yeah. He would sponsor our team. Might have been the dad. I don't know if that was. Yeah. If, you know, yeah. Well, Martin she she know. went through school the whole school with Rawl, and when I first met her at some reunion, um, I uh, introduced myself and. I said, I'm Rawl's nephew, and she started to cry, and then she couldn't talk to me. But then we made contact by phone, and uh, she told me, yes, I knew your uncle, he was a wonderful man, and blah, blah, blah. But he was engaged to a girl that they called Ginger. I don't know her last name. She lived in some apartments right behind Uncle Don's toy shop. Oh. Raul was in, uh, engaged to her? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, he would have been 90 years old this, this year, because he was born in 1924, correct? Yeah. And so he would have graduated from high school in he like 40? He or, didn't or, graduate. Oh, he didn't. Oh. Mm -hmm. So what did he do when he got out of school? Remember Grandpa? I told you that his dad used to pull him out of school. He had turned 18 and he had finished his, you know, he was going to finish his sophomore year. So they, uh, you know, greetings, uh, you know, report in, so they all did. And uh, then you take your entrance exams and then you, you tell them that you want to take and you'd like to try to qualify to be a pilot. And they gave him the test. Well, according to Rawl, in those days when he came home from leave, he told my brother that he just missed being a pursuit pilot by a couple of points on that test. Now, see, that should tell you something. With two years of high school, see, and that's why he got flight engineer, because the flight engineer runs that aircraft. He knows everything. In fact, he has a little desk right behind the pilot, co-pilot. And when they take off, the flight engineer kneels between the two pilots and watches certain gauges, probably oil pressure and stuff. And then, uh, and then a friend of one of the boys that was killed in that accident on the same aircraft had a friend named Jim Force. And he was at Molesworth, England, where they were stationed, ready, to, awaiting his orders to come home. He had done his 25, I think he said, or 35, anyways. Uh, he went over for their orientation meetings because they needed to be told certain things you know, in case they were caught prisoners or whatever. And uh, they, uh, he told this uh, friend, uh, the pilot really of Rawl, who flew as a co-pilot, uh, Lieutenant Alderman flew as the pilot of that mission. Right now his name escapes me, but uh, uh, he told him, listen, uh, I'm going to have these people, these sergeants, wake me up so I can make this mission with you. I'll go along. Well, they didn't. So he missed the mission, got up, and it was too late. They had gone. And lo and behold, they didn't come back. Yeah, let's, uh, first of all, why don't you hold that there? I want to get uh, a good close-up. And this would have been taken... Um, this was taken in Nebraska at a studio shop uh, 
close by to his base that was in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. South Dakota. Uh -huh. And there is where he went after his leave prior to going overseas. Mm. And this is where the uh, this is where the air crew of the B-17 uh, got together. Oh, oh yeah, right. And right. trained as a crew. Yeah. Then they, you know, they flew probably to New York, and then right. they used to put extra gas tanks in the Bombay area, and they'd fly to England, you know. Prior to going to Rapid City, do you know where he went to? Uh, basic training and all that stuff? He went to Camp Swift in Texas. Okay. And then he went to Amarillo. I don't know the name of the base there, but it, that was a gunnery school. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, he's studying his books full of information. Yeah. And then he came to Kingman, Arizona, which I understand has a little museum. And I plan to go there someday. We tried to to find it, and we did, but it, it was closed oh. that day. Um, anyway, on the old Route 66. Yes, he did uh, his high altitude training there because some men could not take the flying, you know, so high even with oxygen. And uh, he told my brother that he did fly over Palm Springs a couple of times, you know, yeah. and uh, and he came home, you know, and this is the last time I saw him. What year was that? That was 45, I think it was December of 45, uh, no, 44, and he reported in back to the base uh, probably the first days of January and then he was sent to Rapid City, uh, South Dakota, and they did a lot of flying around there and stuff, and then they went overseas. And he arrived in Molesworth, England, the 23rd of March, 1945. He had, uh, well, two weeks, really, of uh, orientation. In the 8th Air Force. Yes. What bomb group do you know? The, the, 420s, uh, the 303rd Bomb Group. 427th Bombardment Squadron, and he flew that, that one mission. Uh, tell, uh, why don't you go through that mission for us, uh, uh, tell me what you know about it from start to finish. Well, speaking with men who flew in those missions, because I went to a reunion in Savannah, Georgia, of this squadron of this group mm -hmm. and I went and spoke with some of the survivors of the 427 bombardment squadron and uh, they told me that uh, in reality uh, when it came to getting into the aircraft and they knew the percentages of survival which had gotten better towards the end of the war many of the airmen would not get on the aircraft. They would refuse to do their duty and subsequently they were relegated to menial jobs around the base. They weren't going to let them come home. They were just, you know. But uh, basically that's it. And uh, uh, the crews had been cut down from ten to eight. And uh, Probably because fighters, Germans didn't have much to put up against them fighter-wise. Yeah. It was still yeah. the flak, probably, that yeah. was the... So they, they had lost most of their pilots and they had lost, well, the ability for fuels, you know, and ammunition and stuff. And, and we had fighters to help protect our bombers right. a lot more than we had before, too, probably. Right. And uh, as um, they went to bomb Leipzig marshalling yards. And where is that? Where's Leipzig that? is uh, a little bit to the uh, west 
southwest of Berlin, uh, pretty close to Chemnitz. In Germany? Yes. And they were flying on the south side, the, the south side of, uh, of Germany, and uh, they happened to get close to the Czech border when they turned left and headed north. Well, the wind was blowing in that direction, and uh, it was about, they say, 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers from the target. And they were going to go bomb the marshalling yards in Leipzig. That's railroad yards. Yes. So he, because I spoke to a co-pilot of another aircraft who witnessed the accident, and he was on his deathbed, I think in Ohio. Uh, I spoke to him, and he said, yes. Uh, Mr. Pareto, he said, I saw your uncle's plane. He, he was in my squadron. And they were below us a little bit to the right. And he said, the other B-17 went out of control and slid sideways down and hit my uncle's plane, stayed together for a few moments, and then they broke apart. Well, Lieutenant Lacker, that was his uh, name of the other aircraft, lost power to the engines and he went in circles down. And my uncle's plane blew up. And uh, so I think he died instantly. And most of the crew fell fairly close together to where the engines were in the tail section. And that's the field where you saw uh, where he fell. And, uh, and uh, there was a Lieutenant Weinberger who went on that mission. And I believe Lieutenant Weinberger was the uh, armorer, the one who made sure the bombs were going to explode before they dropped them. And they, when they disinterred the bodies, his belt, his uniform pants, had inside a stapled name tag from the laundry, Weinberger. <laughs> That's all they knew it was him. And, yeah. Did and any of the crew survive? No. no and what didn't. about the other plane? Did they? they no. They didn't get. They didn't make it down either. No. I I uh, was taken out to a little farm, and they showed me where the plane hit. Well, there's nothing there anymore. But you know, it it exploded also among when it made impact. I know in that uh, video you gave me, uh, there was a, a gentleman who I think was like seven years old at the time and yes. said that he saw what happened. What, yes. did, he, what did he tell you? He, he's in the picture. As you see the picture that you videotaped on my copy, the little blonde haired boy all the way to the left, and there's a little girl I think on the engine. Yeah. Well, later on, there's another picture that I have that he is on top of that engine, you know, after they cooled down. The kids used to go out there and play, you know. Yeah. But it was him. And we spoke, you know, through an interpreter and uh, also an elderly gentleman, uh, much older, a little older than he, he was, uh, he said that he had come back home to Lusnitz after the war. And somehow he bought a flatbed truck and he put boxes in the back so he could transport whatever, you know, people wanted. And he was driving by this little Lutheran church when the Russians were disinterring those graves of my, of my uncle's crew. 
Well, he had to stop, you know, you know, the Russians, you know. So he helped the Russians load. Now, he said a lot of the remains were already mixed. They were put in a certain portion of the back of his truck. But he thinks your uncle and I think two others were separate and they were uh, not intact. Because, uh, I could tell you the truth, but what for, you know? I have the medical records of the pathologist. Anyways, uh, they took uh, this little truck with some Russian soldiers to Kimnitz. 30, 40 kilometers away to a warehouse. And he remembers, he said, they had all the dog tags right here on the seat. When they got there, those soldiers took those dog tags, put the bodies in the warehouse, and gave it to a, some commandant or whatever. So they asked him when the American soldiers were notified, they came by, or some officer uh, asked him what happened. Uh, he said they took them, they disappeared because the Russians told us, lieutenant or whatever his rank was, we never saw any, uh, you know, dog tags. But then the Germans. <laughs> Being so, uh, how shall we say it, meticulous in their record keeping, had made a list of those dog tags. And we, we saw, I have a copy somewhere, Rolar Priester. So I said to myself, you know what? Uh, his dog tags may have been damaged, and uh, they did their best to. You know, but it was my uncle. So it was in Eastern Germany, more mm -hmm. or less. I mean, yeah. after the separation, uh, the, uh, it always it was yeah. the Russian control or yeah, East Bloc or whatever you might call it, Eastern. They told me that after the war, the Russians discovered uranium in that area. They shut down that area. They gave them special IDs to everybody and they could not leave without permission. So they were stuck, see. And very indoctrinated and stuff, and kind of, they're kind of suspicious of you. And uh, uh, I met the mayor, and they showed us around, took us out for some uh, real nice sweet rolls. <laughs> coffee in an old museum and they told us the history of the little town. Did they speak English? Uh, uh, not? Very, very uh, rough. Uh, uh, my best buddy, uh, he's the archivist or was the historian of the little town. Uh, his last name Nasala. Do you remember the first name? I can't remember his first name right now. His, his um, his wife's name was Hanalode Nasala, a very nice couple. He said he was born after the war, but he was getting ready to retire, and he just thought it was great that I showed up, you know. And I showed him the pathology reports, and, and there was, I have some letters written in German, which he could read, and he's the one that took us around. So and that was what year were you over there? What was it, honey? Two o three or two o six? O three, I think it was. And I believe you said eventually uh, Raoul was uh, buried in uh, an American cemetery in Belgium, was it? Yes, he he was um, buried at uh, Neuville in Condros little village on one of the main streets of Liege going towards, I believe, Brussels. Uh, it's tank country, you know, you can see. And uh, it's the Ardennes A lot of the area. guys from the Battle of the Bulge, probably. Yeah. And uh, in fact, my other uncle, uh, 
Frank Fontes uh, was a medic and drove an ambulance and uh, he's pictured in one of the documentaries picking up the frozen lower body of Rocky Blount who is in this documentary and does speak. Uh, but some people in the family thought maybe it's not him. But the camera was right in his face and he turned to face the camera and it's, it's my Uncle Frank, you know, Pancho. And, uh, and I made copies of it and the family went crazy, you know. There he is. God, too bad he didn't live long enough to see his own. But anyways, um, what was I saying? <laughs> Well, we're talking about uh, where Ralph's buried now. Yeah, so so, that, so yeah. he's there. Uh, I think it's fifty-five, hundred, something like that. And uh, it, it's beautiful, <laughs> manicured. Uh, the crosses are white marble. Uh, yeah, I think we've got uh, to it's the, it's just yeah. beautiful, and uh, yeah. uh, they have a beautiful uh, cottage. A reception. You go in there, and on a corner there's a bust of Benjamin Franklin, and uh, some of the doors have eagles uh, inscribed in them, and uh, there's a book you sign. And then the the guardian of the place came in, and and uh, he said, in this book you'll find where he's at. So we quickly went through the book, and he knew exactly. So we walked slowly, you know. And my dad was getting to an age where he was only going to last another nine years, I think. And uh, he uh, he went out there and, and he stayed quiet for a while. And he was talking with some of the people there. Uh, but uh, the first time I went out there, when I really felt, you know, that I was there with him, and uh, I buried uh, a little, uh, you know, those little cards they give out at funerals, his mother's, and I put it in a little plastic sack and, and buried it there. And then I grabbed some leaves, I think it was, that had fallen from some nearby trees. And then uh, another time I went, I did put some dirt, which I'm not supposed to do, in a baggie and brought it home. As I did on Omaha Beach, I went there with my dad. But uh, it's how, sad, you know. How did, how did it affect his parents when they found out? That, or did they know right away? Uh, how did they find out? Do you know? It was missing in action. Uh, the way I was told it happened, uh, uh, they were there in the house, and Stella was there with her mother, and uh, Mr. Emmett Williams, who was the postmaster here in town, came with two nurses from the Torney Army Hospital. And they knocked on the door and they let him in. And uh, Emmett Williams knew my mother, grandmother couldn't read English, so she gave it to Stella and Stella read it. Well, Stella, you know, started crying and she said, it told her mother that uh, Raul is missing in action. And uh, so the nurses offered my grandmother a tranquilizer, you know, something to put her to sleep for a while or something. No, 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 my grandmother, I can just see her. No, 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 I don't want any of that. No, no. Is there anything we can do for you, Mrs. Prieto? No, no, no. You know, telling my my aunt what to say, and uh, so they left. 
it was a few minutes after they closed the door that she just lost it. And uh, she was a courageous woman. You know, this we knew from her life. She was a midwife to a lot of women because some people, you know, they don't do those things, you know. But she, for instance, every Christmas, she would make food for the needy down in old section 14. And she'd walk around on those bandy old legs of hers and, you know, made people feel good. And then we knew she was going to come with a big sack full of Christmas presents for us. And uh, as I started to grow up, I'd go with my grandpa to work, you know. He always had a roll of bills, my grandfather. And pull out. Is that enough, Hernan Cortes? He would say to me. He would call me Hernan Cortes. Sí, abuelo, es bastante, me da mucho dinero. I told him, you give me too much money. But, you know, three, four bucks in those days. So, anyways, <laughs> he didn't pick me up all the time, you know. He used to take Frank, uh, the young uh, Frank boy who just died, who was married to Dora. Uh, he used to take him to work, you know, and he'd take uh, uh, sometimes other people, you know, and they, but uh, this was after uh, Raul didn't come back and uh, see, the, you see, the way I felt, I, I felt anger, okay, as a little kid I really got mad. But then, uh, as I started to get older, I used to say, my God, why do they take the best? Why did God take this bright young man who could have done something for his parents, maybe bought a newer house or something, you know? Why didn't he come home? You know, and... and uh, and then I'd see little things that belonged to him, you know. He gave me a handful of uh, 45 slugs, you know, just the heads of the thing. I don't know what I did with them. And then those little caps they used to wear, those knitted caps. And, uh, and then a, a baseball, a bo uh, softball jersey used to say Buicks. So he had played for a team in the community by the name of Buicks. And he was always doing something. As a kid, he built a um, soapbox racer. You know what that is? <laughs> he put him on a hill. He built it so well that I think every kid in town had a ride in it. <laughs> and I tried to think, you know, where, where would he get a good run, you know? Well, up West Ramon. It's a good run down to Palm Canyon, you know? <laughs> and I said, you know, this guy had the kids going nuts, you know? But, uh, and then he built that car. And then on his wall of his bedroom, he chiseled some markings. I think they were Aztec. Oh, they lasted for years there. And, uh, but my grandmother uh, passed on the Purple Heart to my dad. And then my dad finally said, well, you take it. And I've passed it on to my nephew who lives in San Diego. Because I figure younger people in the family should have it to pass on. But uh, I made the effort to go to see uh, the 427th uh, Bombardment Squadron historian. Can't remember his name, but he lived in San Clemente. 
So I went there and he said, yes, I'm the historian. What do you want to know? And so he took me into the garage. He had boxes and boxes of uh, flight data, you know, and reports and stuff. And he found it. There it was. And uh, then I started to make contact with the men who were in the 303rd Bomb Group and the 427 Bombardment Squadron, the ones, of course, that were still alive. And they're the ones that sent me, and I became a member of the squadron. I became a member of the uh, 303rd Bomb Group, and I became a life member of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, it was hard for me, you know. It was hard for us. My dad just shut up. I didn't want to talk about it. And uh, he used to use a word in Spanish like "too bad," you know, "too bad" that his brother, with so much talent, could not have survived that damn war. April the 6th, all air operations ceased the 26th of April. And I know, I think you've been instrumental in getting him honored here in Palm Springs. Yes, uh, I've done my best. I, you know, I, uh, every time uh, I speak about my, uh, my uncle in public, I make sure that my grandmother gets the kudos, <laughs> the, the, the honor of uh, losing it. You see, what happens? And what are some of the honors that have uh, resulted from your efforts? We try to get him home, his remains, my, my cousin Frank. Tell him that I'll pay for it. The government doesn't have to pay a penny. But there was a law passed, I think it was in 51, that no more killed in action overseas whose closest relatives had given up that right to have the remains returned at that time, it was all shut down. Well, it, uh, this um, our historian yes. at the American Legion is a, a man named Lee Wilson. And Lee is a teacher at Cathedral City High School. Well, he lost two boys, two students in those damn Gulf Wars. And uh, some lady from Coachella came to see him. And uh, she says, you know, uh, we're making banners to honor our, our veterans. And uh, went ahead and did the, uh, the banners. And there's one out here in the front of the museum. Probably one of the, Eugene's being very modest, but I think one of the main things that he's done for the memory of Raul is his being instrumental in naming the main hall at the American Legion for Raul. Well, but through his efforts uh, and uh, petitioning and talking to people there at the Legion, uh, it, it was forthcoming. And yeah. somebody put up a little plaque like this, well, uh, later on it was changed to a larger plaque. And uh, as you go in the door, in the main door, it's right over the front. Yeah, the. Uh, one of the banners, the new banners that uh, are the new designated uh, honoring mode <coughs> is right outside the front door. Inside the front door, over the door, is the plaque honoring Raul. And to the right is a section of the wall that has a large picture a blow up of this photo. Yeah. And underneath the script that describes him and his accomplishment. To the left of that is a small 
mm, probably eight and a half by eleven, that has different artifacts that relate to his time in the service, oh. whether it's a medal or a um, cartridge, um, and explanation thereof. And it's I want, every time I go, I look at it because it's so inspiring and rewarding, and I think this is a man who I'm sorry I didn't get to know. Yeah. What? Uh, it, you know, they just, uh, he's gone, you know. I just, uh, it's hard to believe that such a vibrant person could be gone from one instant to another. And fighting for us, and uh, uh, when I was in the Navy, I, I used to think if I ever get in a combat or anything, this old ship of mine <laughs> is going to catch hell. But I said, well, I've got to do my duty, you know, what do you, you know, what you join for? But that's the way it is in this service, you know. You make fun of it. You damn it. You wish you were home. You wish you were doing other things, but God darn you have your duty. Well, Raul certainly did his duty. <laughs> he sure did. He sure did. And yeah. I want to thank you for sharing with us, and I want to thank Raul for his yeah. service to our country. and. Uh, yeah. the mankind in general. I have one more comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, as an observer, as Eugene's wife, in all the years that we've been together, Raul has been foremost in his mind in, in many aspects. And from my point of view, he has lived on through Eugene. Uh, Eugene has done things in Raoul's name and in his honor that no one else has done in the family. He's taken the mantle and he's taken it to the full quarter. And I see that as a reward. I see that as an inspiration to others. And I hope that the young people in the family and in others will see that. Eugene has been um, adamant many times about his concern and his method of honoring Raoul. And uh, the reward, people know who Raul R. Prieto is. Yes. Well said. Well said. Next thing is Cayenne Celia. <laughs> Since it's on Indian land between Alejo and Ramon, I want to see that name change. I wouldn't su be surprised to see it one of these days. Yeah. It should. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks again, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.